Hello, you're about to hear Good Morning Seminole, our monthly signature event. Please enjoy. So our presentation today is on funding in Central Florida businesses. Please join me in welcoming today's moderator to the stage from Orlando Inno, who has partnered with us for today's amazing program. Please welcome reporter Alex Sodstrom. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for having me. I appreciate the chamber uh, inviting uh, me out and let me uh, moderate this. Um, all uh, I'm going to do now is just call up our, uh, our panelists and they will, I guess, uh, grab their seats and then uh, we'll get started. So uh, first up, we've got Amy Yoder, CEO of Anuvia Plant Nutrients. Uh, up, up next is uh, Mitchell Lasky, co-founder and managing partner of Deep Work Capital. <laughs> Last, uh, certainly not least, Raquel Asa, chief marketing officer with Beep. <laughs> All right, now that everyone's settled in. So I just gave uh, just kind of the names and titles of these folks because I really wanted them to kind of uh, you know explain what their you know companies do and uh, kind of what their role is. Um, so if we could ask everyone just kind of start with a quick 30 second uh, elevator pitch of your company, and uh, then we'll we'll get started with the actual uh, fundraising aspect. But Amy, let's start with you. Uh, just quick uh, pitch on your your company. Sure. Can you guys hear me? Okay, cool. Um, so Anuvia Plant Nutrients is a bio-based fertilizer company. So what does that mean? What that means is we actually take organic waste materials that normally would go into a landfill, we break them down, and we actually make a fertilizer that can be used in main-scale agriculture, meaning corn, soybeans, cotton, all over the world. What the advantages are for that, uh, the nutrients that we have actually don't leach or go into the environment, so it has a significantly less environmental footprint than conventional fertilizer that goes out today, as well as we put organic matter back into the soil, so we feed the soil so we can regenerate the soil. And having healthy soils en en entitles you to having good crops, good food production for many years to come. All right, Mitch, here, tell us about Deep Work. Thanks. So Deep Work Capital is an early stage venture capital firm. We're headquartered in uh, Orlando. We have uh, four of our own funds, uh, proprietary funds, and then we also manage uh, for the state of Florida, the Florida Opportunity Fund, which is through the Enterprise Florida. Um, we currently have about $220 million of uh, assets under management and um, about 30, 30 companies in our proprietary portfolio and another 15 in the state portfolio. Awesome. And then Raquel, tell us about Beep. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for hosting such an amazing event. I, I, it's incredible to see the amount of growth when you look at startups in the, in the state, uh, especially within Seminole County and Orlando. So a little bit about Beep, who we are, what we do. So we're a technology company that develops software to support autonomous shuttles and networks in routes throughout the state of Florida. We started here. We're actually an Orlando-based business uh, in Lake Nona, but we, we have since over the last three years grown nationally. But we have Honestly, a lot of our success has been attributed to the success we've had here within the state, uh, mainly from the aspect of supportive legislation that allows us to do what we do, uh, but also the workforce as well has supported a lot of our growth as a company. Uh, in terms of how much money we have raised to date, uh, having been three years in operation in Lake Nona, we have raised $50 million to date, and we're also backed by Intel Capital, ABS Capital, TDF Ventures, and one of our main funding partners is uh, Blue Lagoon. Awesome. And then I'm selfishly going to give a quick pitch on uh, me and my organization. I'm with Orlando Inno. It is a, a part of the Orlando Business Journal. It's a uh, online media publication. We cover startup technology and entrepreneurship news here in Central Florida. Um, and I've definitely uh, written plenty about all these folks. So uh, uh, just wanted to, uh, to give that shout out. Uh, we're here to talk about, uh, as Raquel just mentioned here, uh, venture capital, fundraising for startups, specifically tech startups here in Orlando and Central Florida. And uh, the reason that this is such a big topic right now is it's been a huge year um, for Central Florida companies. And uh, I mean, based on the, the data that at least I have and what I've looked at and covered throughout the year, I know we have at least, uh, I believe, $800 million in uh, venture funds and, and, and private equity funds poured into local companies this year. Um, if you add some uh, other like private money that's been raised by some publicly traded companies in town, it's well over a billion dollars in capital raised uh, so far this year, which is 
which is huge. Um, so, so we w brought these folks in to kind of give some more insight on what they're doing. Uh, and Raquel, you just mentioned kind of Beep's pretty impressive uh, number there. Amy, how much money has uh, Anuvia raised to date? So in the five years that I've been with Anuvia, we've raised uh, pretty close to $300 million. Um, started uh, five years ago with, with, I was the fourth employee. Uh, we now have over 150 employees with operations in Winter Garden is where the headquarters is, and then we have a manufacturing facility in Plant City. Yeah. And, and Mitch, can you say how much Deep Work has deployed, maybe just like companies in the state portfolio? Yeah, so we've, de well, we've deployed uh, in our own funds about $90 million, 70% of, 70 of which is in the state of Florida, and then in the Florida Opportunity Fund, uh, about $125 million, all of which is in the state of Florida. And that's in three programs. There's a, uh, an early stage venture capital program, there's an early stage fund to fund program, and then there's a clean energy program. Excellent. That's so that, oh, yeah, so that, that gives you an idea of kind of what we're, uh, the scope of what we're talking about here and the folks involved today. Um, so now as we get into these questions, just keep in mind, let's try to keep like 30 second answers, keep it short and sweet, because we've got a lot of cover uh, we want to, uh, to make sure we get to everything. Um, but I, I first want to start with just kind of a general question. Uh, as I talked about, a big year so far for Central Florida in terms of fundraising, not typically thought of as kind of this you know, tech startup venture capital hub. And uh, it's been a few years now, pretty consistent, uh, pretty high numbers in terms of dollars companies are raising. What do y'all think uh, maybe has you know, kind of led to that? I don't know if that's something that's happening here internally in Central Florida, if uh, something else is making outside investors uh, uh, you know, notice us. Uh, just curious you know, kind of what you guys are seeing uh, that's driving that. Maybe Raquel, we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, I think when you think about investment in tech and in investment in multiple forms of technology, you always think South Florida, or you, you know, we're centrally based here within Central Florida, right within the Orlando Seminole County area, and it's often very hard to, uh, you, when you live in a theme park, uh, you know, defined area, uh, for us to be seen as otherwise. I will say, though, one of the ama most amazing things is the ability that over the last, you know, several years, and Alex, you hit the nail right on the head, is the consistency in growth. And when you have consistent growth year over year over year, people start to look at your area and wonder, well, what's happening there that is allowing for the consistent growth? And when you have companies who are dedicated to being here, one, because we're either originally from here, uh, we this is Chamber of Commerce weather. I mean, who doesn't want to live here? I, uh, how many of you are actually transplants, right, from other parts of Florida, right? You have moved here for a reason, and now one of our biggest secrets is now no longer a secret, and, and people are finding this is definitely the place that we want to start because you don't have to be tied to urban centers. If there's one thing the pandemic taught us is you can continue to do innovation. You don't have to live in specific areas to do that. Mitch, what are you next? Yeah, I think it's a culmination of a, of a couple of different reasons. You know, firstly, if you think about venture capital on a national scale, 45% of all venture capital happens in three states, California, New York, Texas, right? So we're all underserved. But this, is a, but this has happened over, you know, not two years or one year, you know, this is years in the making, right? Transforming our economy from being citrus and tourism and real estate into the innovation economy. And it takes successes. So we've built some companies, we've, we've been able to put those in the marquee as Florida bred and built successes. And then you have the great migration that has happened over the last couple of years, which is taking some of the best and the brightest and to Raquel's point, bringing them to Florida because it's a great place to be and a great place to build businesses. Yeah, so when I came uh, and joined Anuvia um, six years ago, I actually could put the headquarters anywhere that I wanted. That was basic, that was one of the key, key areas, right? So the founders had their beginning technology in a lab and we could have chosen anywhere. Um, I chose Central Florida was really specific reasons. One, as people are now reporting, but at that time you could see the tax, uh, advantages and the work-life environment was pushing people to move to this central Florida region, right? And everybody that lives here knows that the theme parks basically stay within the I-4 corridor, and if you go outside of that, it's a great place to live. Um, <laughs> and so and so what that allows you to do is it, it attracts talent, right? So talent, talent comes down. It gives them an opportunity to be able to do that. 
The other thing for me that was a real key, so remember we're an ag tech company, so having access to biotechnology, biology, chemistry is really important. Having two really good universities for research and development, because we partner with those, was also important. So UF is left, you know, a couple hours away, hour and away, and UCF is literally 45 minutes. So for us, it really was those three factors. Absolutely. Okay, so I, we're talking a lot about, you know, the successes. Obviously, this is a lot of uh, good stuff here for Central Florida and the region, but I'm curious, just to kind of put it in perspective, I don't want anyone to think that, you know, Raising capital is necessarily easy for companies, right? And so, especially for the two the two companies, for Amy and Raquel, um, I'm curious if y'all could put in perspective, you know, uh, compared to all the other priorities, you know, your company has, you know, how much, how high up there is, you know, raising capital, uh, you know, coordinating with existing investors, you know, courting new investors, you know, just kind of how much time does that maybe, you know, take up and, and how much effort do you really have to put into that? And, and Amy, if you can maybe start. So I don't know how Raquel's perspective, but from a CEO perspective, it's 70% of my time. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much all I do. So if you would have told me five years ago that I would basically be interacting with investors and raising money on a consistent basis rather than operating the business, I would have laughed, had no concept of that. So this is my first startup. You know, I come from basic corporate company, um, but it is, it is literally what I do because you, are, you will never, as an entrepreneur, have enough money. You'll never have enough capital until you get to the point where you are actually at a time to go to either a public market or something else, right? So you are, that you are constantly doing that. It always takes longer than what you think, and so you always have to plan on it from that perspective. So it just takes a lot of time. So I would say, on behalf of our CEO, yes, that is exactly what he does <laughs> as well. I mean, uh, every dollar that you raise is always difficult, and getting the first dollar is never easier when you try to get the second, right? And you're constantly thinking about the future. 75% is based off of what do you project the future to be. 25% is the day-to-day, -day, right? And so when you look at how startups are constantly, one of our, our co-founders used the analogy of, he's a sailor, right? He, of course, he owns a yacht because he would, because he you know, has gotten and very successful in his entrepreneurs. But it's the analogy he uses when you're riding a boat, you've got your RPMs just blaring all the way to the far end. And then at one point, you just start coasting. And, and day in and day out, that high RPMs is what you feel on a daily basis because you're constantly thinking about the future. 75% uh, of our time for our CEO is also based on that as well. Yeah, yeah and I see that. it shows you just kind of the, you know, again, how, how essential and how much effort it takes to just to be successful on this front. Um, so Raquel, we're going to come right back to you because I want to ask, uh, uh, you know, specifically for, for Beep, um, you know, obviously, you guys have been in the OBJ and stuff, but I know plenty of other news outlets have covered you. You guys are, you know, always in TV and all this stuff. You're a former reporter. So I'm curious, you know, kind of um, uh, how much do you attribute, you know, the success in maybe public relations, community relations, that kind of stuff, uh, to, to being successful in Beep's kind of fundraising track record? And, you know, I don't know if that helps you kind of attract investors, uh, find folks like that. Sure. Uh, much like cash is king, uh, awareness is just equally important, especially for a startup. One of the biggest challenges you have as a startup is having people understand who you are, what you do, and why you matter and why you're different. Uh, and so uh, it's funny, when you talk to people who have been part of startups, they'll always tell you what employee number you were. So I love that <laughs> he says, I was employee number four. I was employee roughly 20 when I first started about two and a half years ago. Uh, we are now 80 strong uh, throughout the country. Uh, so when you look at brand awareness and having people understand, much like raising capital is important, you have to have people understand why you are important and what you're delivering from everybody else. One of the biggest questions we always get asked is, okay, I love what you do, who's your competition, right? And I always say as chief marketing officer, well, we're our only competition, but in all honesty, we always tell those who we sit at the table with who want to do business with us is, look at us as your form of awareness of the AV industry because it's still very nascent, but we invite you, we, we, we tell people, go out and ask these five questions as you look at implementing this type of technology for your community. And if you can find that they answer these five questions effectively, much like we have done for you today, come back to us because you will not find anybody who can answer all those five questions. So we encourage people who sit at the table as who want to do business with us, 
invest your money wisely, right, uh, with those that you want to ingest into the community. Uh, public relations and public affairs, also incredibly important for us as a tech company. We never want to be a big bad tech company that comes into a community and says, you shall use this, this shall be part of what you do, uh, and that's it. We actually place part of my role as well as public affairs and community engagement. I engage every stakeholder from government all the way down to the community, much like chambers like this as well. So you know exactly what's coming when before we ever get there. And you know what our purpose is before we're even there. And that's how Raquel, we might have to it. cut that right there. Yeah. Sorry, just because I, I want to make sure, Amy, I want to hear your thoughts on, you know, Earned media, or, or sorry, <laughs> earned media, utilizing that. I mean, is that you know important for for Nuvia, kind of getting that, you know, just just public, uh, you know, notoriety and, and status, or, or how important does that factor in for, for your company? We actually use it on a couple of different levels, right? So I always call it we have our our face to our customer, meaning agriculture and farmers, and then we have our face to public relations, which is um, everybody out here. Right, so, and it's two different things. So when we go to the farmer, we have a very technical farm-oriented message that they understand. We actually, the challenge that we find is being able to take that message and be able to put it in something that's fairly succinct, people that can understand, because when you're dealing with investors and no, you know, <laughs> not being negative, Mitch, they don't really know what you do, right? And so because they don't really know what you do, you have to actually simplify it in a way that actually makes it compelling, that they can understand, and they can see where it's actually going to make a difference in the world. When I go to the ag community, they totally understand what we do, right? It's helping them be more sustainable in the long run. And that's, that's important. They care about that. But when you're talking to somebody that doesn't understand ag, they don't quite get that. So for me, we actually hit not only what I call our local con customer media, but we hit, we're on from Fast Company to LinkedIn. You know, we use all those because those are all important. And as we are, and we also use our investors because our investors are very well networked globally. And so from that perspective, that allows us to be able to uh, get to different forms of capital as well as introductions into different parts of the world. Yeah, and, and Mitch, I'm curious, you know, as an investor, uh, you know, do y'all like to see that? Is that, you know, high on the priority list in terms of, you know, portfolio companies, you know, getting that, that media, or I don't know how that factors yeah, in. Yeah, I mean, I mean, as an investor, one of the things you're hoping is that the companies can, can, see, can succeed in the various market uh, segments for all the different constituents that they serve, right? So, yeah, if they, if they have a, a product or service that needs government oversight or hopefully a mandate even, right? You gotta, you gotta be active in the government affairs area. If you, have, if you have more money that you need to raise, you wanna be able to have network uh, into other investors and other capitals of uh, other pools of capital. If you have customer segments that need to understand why you're better than the other guy down the street, you need to be able to sell the value proposition, right? So yeah, I think marketing, marketing is and, and brand awareness and public relations is such an important aspect of all the businesses that we try to participate in. Yeah. Well, and I kind of want to follow up on that just kind of taking a step back just from that that uh, public relations aspect but you know we've got two really you know unique products here that these companies offer and services but I'm curious you know from an investor perspective beyond just that there's so many companies out there right offering uh, you know some distinct uh, potentially you know innovative product but but what else is an investor are you really looking for what are the key things that you always are going to key in on in the company you know for us it's it's always about people it's the human capital that's the most important and it's about the ability to Focus, focus on the things that you really can effectuate change and control, and then executability, right? Make sure that what you do is what you say you're going to do and set the expectations properly. And if you need to change, communicate, right? And be open and transparent with your, inve with your investors. And, and, and curious to hear from each of you too, you know, if, if again, when you're doing, uh, you know, the, the, your company's kind of pitched to investors too. If, if you know that kind of lines up with what Mitch said, or, or, or kind of what you guys want to highlight, you know, for potential investors, uh, Amy, we'll start with you. Yeah, no, it completely aligns with mm -hmm. what Mitch said. So it's really important to have transparency. Um, the management team is actually critical and key to success. Meaning, they need to be working together. They need to be able to execute, and they do need to be able to focus. And the reason I say that is, it is very easy to get pulled off task and go down 20 different routes. And quite frankly, you will never have enough money to do that. So you need to pick your, you need to pick your path, 
pivot when you need to, meaning it doesn't go exactly the way you want to, so be a quick to pivot and head, to the, head in that same direction, maybe slightly differently, but stay in constant communication with your investors and set expectations properly, I think is very key. Yeah, so expectation account. setting is, is critical. Uh, we actually have monthly cadences with our investors to let them know here's where we are today, here's how our pipeline is growing, but also here are our strategic initiatives that we're setting forth to make sure we have a five year game plan, right? You know, government always works within what is your 20 year transportation plan. Startups obviously is a lot shorter. Uh, so for us, we have five year strategic plans that we look at each year we pivot if necessary, depending on the market. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we've been talking about, or I was at least talking about kind of the amount you know, of capital raised so far by Central Florida companies this year, which is obviously huge. Uh, there was another particular milestone this year. We had one of our uh, local companies, Stax, which is uh, actually, uh, and Deep Work was one of the early investors in Stax. They were formerly known as Fat Merchant, fintech startup based here in Orlando. And they, uh, this year became Orlando's first, I guess you would call, completely homegrown, you know, always based in Orlando, uh, unicorn, which if you don't know, Unicorn is a tech company or a company with, private company with a valuation of a billion dollars or more. Uh, so that's a huge milestone. F female led. Uh, yes, it is. It is. It's a woman led company. Um, so so that, that's a huge milestone for, for Central Florida. Um, but I'm curious, you know, does anyone, uh, I kind of want to hear from you all if there's a, a company you guys are watching, uh, besides your own, obviously, uh, that, you know, you really see as maybe, you know, that, that up and coming uh, tech company here that other folks uh, in Central Florida should be watching. Um, and, and Mitch, you look like I'll you're give ready you to two. go. I'll give you two, <laughs> okay? So the, the first one, first one is a, is a gaming company that's headquartered right here in Lake Mary called uh, Hip Games. They, uh, they build mobile games. They have a golf game that, you know, is one of the leading golf games on both App, uh, Apple and Android, um, something like $40 million uh, uh, a year at 90%. 90% margins, and they have two other games coming in market, and they're also the developer of this new Niantic uh, all-world uh, basketball that's getting released here in the next couple of couple of weeks, and that's Niantic is the uh, the owner of Pokemon Go, so a pretty successful company. The second is a company that recently moved to Florida from Santa Monica. They're called Red Six. Their headquarters is in Miami, but their whole team is uh, out by UCF. They're going to be hiring. Uh, 100 to 200 people this year. They build AR, VR headsets for the U.S. government today, and they're now moving into some com commercial uh, applications. You're going to see a lot about them, and I would think that they have a great opportunity to be a billion-dollar company here in the not-too-distant future. Yeah. Amy, do you have any, uh, any companies you're particularly impressed with or watching here? Mine are not necessarily Florida-based. Mine are looking okay. more a little bit more global. There's a very, there's two very interesting biological companies that I'm very excited about that are actually bringing technology. And as you know, I have an ag bent, right? So, um, from an agricultural perspective, that can start to relate, that can start to replace pesticides with biology. And um, I've been watching them. I think they have really good technology. I think it's something that could be really innovative and help keep crop production uh, where it is, but do it in a much uh, more environmentally safe manner. Fascinating. And Raquel? I should actually give a plug to our uh, corner store clients in Lake Nota. They have this amazing, which you know, Alex has covered before, so I encourage you to look at his coverage on the, the lead accelerator program in Lake Nona. They're on their third cohort right now, and they breed startups within the Lake Nona space. Anyone in there is someone you should be looking at, quite frankly. They get roughly 300 applications each cohort, and it boils it down to, I think it's roughly about six mm -hmm. per cohort. They give them a space to work out, collaborate, collaborative space. Obviously, if you're down to that six, you're a pretty good company to look at. Uh, that specific type of cohort and, the, and that, the way that that program works is focused on sports medicine and wellness. Uh, so definitely something you should be looking at for anybody within the LEAD, L-E-A-D, uh, accelerated program in Lake Nona. Yeah, Lee, definitely worth checking out. I promise I did not uh, pay Raquel for the plug, but <laughs> <did not. laughs> I will say you can read about Lee and the two companies Mitch mentioned at OrlandoInno.com, so check it out. Um, My so, check is in the mail. <laughs> so, so I want to give some, some you know, thoughts and tidbits for the audience here, and, and I, you know, I don't know uh, who may be out there or definitely who may be listening to this later, but uh, if someone out there is, you know, has a business, they're, they're wanting to go out and raise capital, I'm curious if each of you uh, have, you know, Let's keep it to just one, you know, big uh, piece of advice you could give them 
Um, and, uh, and, and Mitch, we'll start with you since uh, obviously you are on the investor side. Yeah, so I, I would think be realistic, firstly, on who you're asking for what, right? So do a real good self-assessment of where are you and where you are are going to have different levels of people that can help you, right, from angels to more sophisticated venture capital firms. Um, be realistic in what you think you can do. Understand your market. To Raquel's point earlier, understand that there are competitors to everybody in everything, even if you don't know who they are. The investors will tell you because they'll do their homework, and um, and they will tell you about things that you didn't even know about. Um, and then be 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 respectful of the fact that you're now going to start taking other people's money. And when you take other people's money, it takes some other sets of responsibilities that now you have to be a good steward of that. And it may have a change of behavior and you have to be able to be amenable to go with a new flow. And, uh, and that, go you know, that governance that, that happens as a result of that. Yeah. Raquel, do you have any uh, insight? So, so one, competition. For I mean, I don't want. I have to keep honing that in because they're, they're going to ask you where do you fit in the market and why are you different and why should I invest in you and not somebody else. Uh, so since you already said that, still want to make that point very, very clear. Competition, understanding who that is, is really important. But two, uh, be patient. Uh, is with life with a startup. Every dollar that you raise is going to be incredibly hard, but be patient and stay true to yourself and your vision as a company. And while you may have moments of pivot, don't pivot too far because you obviously are steadfast in that vision from the very beginning for a reason um, and stay true to it. Yeah. And Amy, I want to hear your thoughts. I think both uh, very good uh, words of advice. Mine is really be patient and be prepared and okay with people telling you no because that will happen way more than you're going to get yes. And so um, you just have to, and you just have to be good with it, right? So I, you know, I can't say it really any plainer than that. It takes, you'll have to knock on 30 doors to get one, particularly when you're starting. When you are first starting and you're not a known entity, you really have a lot of competition around from, not only competition from people in your own market segment, but Think about it, those angel investors are also looking at 30, 40, 50 different companies, right? So they're, they're stacking you up against people in different sectors, things that may be a little hotter than you are. I always call it a little sexier than what you are, you know? Um, and so you have to be able to really succinctly tell your story, stay focused, and, and be prepared to say no and keep, keep working at it. So I wanna hear uh, from each of y'all, uh, can you give us uh, one thing, and this is definitely like a quick 30-second uh, explanation, but, but, but one thing your company's working on right now that you know, you're really excited about um, and know that you, you are on the record. So uh, don't <laughs> <laughs> just caution you there. Uh, Amy, curious to hear your thoughts. So we actually have two that I'm really excited about. One, we're actually launching a biological on our, um, our fertilizer this year, and that, the biological will start to replace uh, conventional nutrition, meaning conventional fertilizer phosphorus and nitrogen. And um, we're very excited about that. We teamed up with a really large partner in uh, Europe called Novozymes to do that. The second is that we will be announcing in about four weeks um, a collaboration with a company called Patronus. They're the largest fertilizer producer in Asia, and they're going to start marketing our products. And so we will be, uh, we'll be expanding into the Asia Pacific region. We're really excited about that. Wow. All right. Mitch, you're up next. Um, mine's not quite that exciting. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, last week we uh, we launched the uh, our the raise for our new fund Deep Work Fund Three, which is our new core fund, hundred million dollar fund, all earmarked for the state of Florida. We're really excited about it. We think uh, it took a long time to kind of get here, and I think we're going to have a lot of capital to invest in new companies. Oh, exciting. Um, so I'm happy to say this is on the record, too. Uh, for us, it's expansion. Uh, started in Florida, right specifically in Lake Nona. But now, uh, for the first time this year, we're going to be expanding to the West Coast, to California, which is great for us as a company, and also expanding our footprint in Central Florida. And uh, Alex, happy to talk to you about this later, but Altamont Springs will be receiving uh, autonomous shuttle routes, uh, one of the largest, I would call, uh, municipal autonomous shuttle networks in routes in the Central Florida region, so very excited for that over the next couple of months. Uh, it is also backed by the state of Florida as well, which is, again, goes to the initial point, funded when you have stakeholder engagement from the state down, it helps. 
Wow. Well, there you go. Seminole County uh, self-driving <laughs> shuttles on the way. We will, we will definitely talk about that. More. Um, Surprise. <laughs> well, so I don't know. Do we, do we still have time for a couple questions? Yeah. So I don't know if we have anyone in the audience. Okay. Is someone bringing a mic around? Okay. Hi, I'm Bridget Lake with the Clot Law. Um, I am personally an investor in one of these new companies, and they are um, also a chamber member. If you've heard, have any of you heard of EV Semi Fleet, which is bringing electric semis into the industry and working significantly with um, the Jacksonville port? Um, just wasn't sure if they were on your radar. Mitch, I would love to connect with you. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, so was, I, I was just wondering if they were on your radar, but EV Semi-Fleet is, um, they're Oviedo homegrown, and yes, yes, very proud of them. So thank you. Anyone, any other questions? Oh, oh, oh. So uh, Mitchell, I know this was not included in the questions I provided you earlier, but um, give a give a scope of the competition for people asking you for money and for your firm. So how many companies come to you every year, and what's the one thing you look at that tries to set them apart? So if you think about sales, sales has a funnel, right? So at the top of our funnel, we think we there are about 1,200 companies that fit our MO within the state of Florida each year. Of those 1,200, we think we get to see about 300, 350, either directly or through uh, programs right around the state. Of those, by the time you get all the way to the bottom, we push about six or eight investments through. So that's how selective it is. And you know, I know Amy said sometimes you have to hear no. Well, I have to deliver no, and that's not so easy either. <laughs> you may have another one over here. Hi, good morning. Chip Calandrio, Lake Mary Life Publishing. Thank you all for this. Just tremendous. Just a question about whenever we hear about VC, it's always the fun part of getting money and investing money and all that. Talk a little bit about the other side. As, as recipients, the expectation to repay it all. As investors, your realistic expectation to get it back. How does it work on the flip side? Well, I'll start there if you like. Um, so yeah, we do like to get our money back, and by the way, with a handsome return if possible. So in my world, that's why we have a fund of a portfolio approach, right? Because unfortunately, you're not going to hit a winner every time as much as we'd like to think so. But the day I write a check, it's I'm giving a joint checking account to you as my portfolio company, so we better be aligned. We better be on the same side of the table. We better have built a relationship of trust, right? Because it's only together that we're going to go potentially achieve our goal. Um, in terms of our, in terms of the work that we do before an investment, just real quickly, you know, we spend time on the team. We spend time on the market. We have to understand the niche that they have in that marketplace. We need to make an assessment on their ability to execute. And then we do a complete study on how we think this thing might exit and monetize over some threshold of time. So all of that is you know, well thought out. And I mean, I'm, I'll speak from us. So we're on our Series D, which is pretty <laughs> much our last one. Um, so your expectations change with each, which, with each series, right? So as you continue to go up and you raise more capital, the expectations in terms of how you exit um, also change. So, you know, we're at a place where we're thinking about um, a public market exit. You know, that would be an IPO. And so making sure that you have the, not only the predictable revenue, predictable EBITDA, um, a good growth scale so that when you do that, you, you IPO as a growth company um, is also important, but also it's putting the process and the procedures and everything in place that allows you to be able to do that so that you can function at that level. And, and, and that's really important. Alignment with the investors is absolutely critical. Um, it is their money. So, you know, we are really prudent in how we, we spend and um, think about utilizing capital. Um, and, you know, it's, it's kind of a joint effort as you continue to go forward on, on where you think your, where, your, where your company exit will be and the exit valuation. We all have a number in our head that we've somewhat aligned on, but that, of course, shifts over time depending on how things go. Yeah. 
Raquel, do you have any insight? Utilization of capital and how you spend that money is critically important. Staying true to your budget, and not only staying true to your budget with the money that they have invested in you, but also ensuring that you're bringing in money to help support that as well. Uh, so I can speak from the marketing aspect. You know, when we get in just of capital, and I'm given my budget, and that uh, it's a very finite number, and I have to stay within that, right? And so when I have to look at initiatives that will help us create that brand awareness, to help us raise more capital, to help us continue to earn more revenue, I have to be incredibly strategic in how I spend that money. Is it make sense to have, as an example, seven of the same widget? Probably not, right? Maybe one and a half of the same widget. You just have to make sure you're spending that money wisely so you can show a return on investment You know, when you eventually have that exit. Raquel, can you say how uh, like often or is Beep in contact with, uh, say, its investors? How often do they oh. want to be updated and stuff like that? We have a board meeting on uh, the no first week of November. Um, we have, like I said, a, a monthly cadence with our yeah. investors every single month. Where are you with pipeline? Where are you with revenue? And then our investors sit on our board as well. Um, and so obviously come board time, you have to make sure that you're meet, meeting each of those benchmarks per quarter. Yeah, Amy, anyway, I'm curious, because you talked about obviously it's a huge amount of time just to to raise capital, but but then you know how much time are you spending you know with your current investors? So we have a lot of investors. So we have there's ones I talk with daily. To be totally honest, I have probably two or three I talk with at least daily. Um, most of them, the the key primary ones I talk with once a week. Uh, we have a regular report out cadence uh, weekly for the investors just on where we are in terms of production and sales. Um, quarterly, we we send out uh, financial information to all of our investors. Um, you know, so we, we have different classes on kind of how we how we manage through the different pieces. Yeah. Well, there you go. Oh, do we have another question? Or? Okay. Well, I think uh, we're at time, but uh, I think thank you for the panelists. This has been great. Uh, thank you for the chamber for hosting us. I, I really appreciate it. And uh... thanks for listening. To learn more about the Seminole County Chamber, please visit SeminoleBusiness.org or check us out on our social media at Seminole County Chamber.